All right, here we go. Another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, local realtor here in Ottawa, Fadi Kudair with Sutton Ottawa. Today, we're hosting somebody here that I've known for a little over 15 years. Kind of funny story how we met, actually, but I'll tell you a little bit once we introduce him. Brian Johnson from BPA. Yes. And part of this is because, so I try to get that personal connection to people to understand that. But it really, part of it came from was uh, one of my earliest projects. I think it did it about 90, about 98. We're not getting any younger, mm-hmm. are we? Um, no. But yeah, about 98, I got a chance. Uh, it was one of my healthcare projects. Uh, I got an opportunity to work on the Ottawa Heart Institute uh, reference center, and there was a pet center. So it was addition to the original Heart Institute. And, you know, you, you work on it. You're a young kid. You're excited. You're doing it. And then a couple of years later, so, uh, my grandfather, uh, who's one of the most influential men in my life, like he's uh, there's my dad, there's my grandfather, and then there's my mentor. But my grandfather, he had he was having a heart problem. He's had heart problems. He had heart problems for 15 years, but farmer, old school, but he had a, there was a valve and the valve was, had, had enough. He was taking his nitro like constantly just to mm-hmm. walk. And, and, uh, the, he lives in Peterborough and the Peterborough hospital said, no, nope, you're going to die on the table. Toronto hospital said, no, nope, you're going to die on the table. And the heart institute say, okay, you've got a percentage here, but we'll put in this, this basically a pig valve to, to, to get your heart going. And he said, you might. And my grandpa was like, look, I can't walk two kilometers anymore and I can't go out into the field. So, uh, let's do it. And then I re- so I went and visited him in the hospital and I'm like, wow, you're inside a part of a building that I helped build. So I helped contribute to building a building that wound up saving my grandfather's life. And I got an extra, I don't know, 12 or 15 years with him. Wow. And it's those kind of moments where, and that's why I try to impart people to recognize what we can do, not only for ourselves, but what we can do to our cities and the places that we live. Like you can change people's lives. I get it. We're not, we're just the structural guys. We're not all people. surgeons, but right. Hey, but we gave the surgeon the room that they can be. We got to contribute to it. You created it, the space. Yeah. In a way. It helped create the space. I always say it's, we always just, we we're helping to be part of it. Yeah. So I love the story. It's uh, again, it just, it brings this, segment to life right like what we're doing what i'm trying to do with this segment that i have is to show people around the city that this city is not boring there's so much going on there's so many businesses out there that are contributing to the day-to-day activities that we're doing and there's so many people that we just don't give enough credit for yeah yeah there's i mean it's there's it's i think ultimately we we should be really really proud of our city i know we have some challenges right now with our downtown core and trying to revitalize that but this is I, I know some people that, for example, have, uh, you know, they they work in Toronto, right? And they're doing development here in Ottawa. And, you know, they, they because they're doing development here in Ottawa, they're here a little bit more. And even that they said, like, you know, they're from the big city, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and for the longest time, you know, well, Toronto's the center of the universe. Nothing, not to offend anybody from Toronto. <laughs> wonderful city. I'm going there a lot. But uh, they they spent uh, some time here, a lot of time here last year. Just in the, And they were like, wow, your city is, I really love your city. Like, it's, it's, it's a, yeah, we don't have some of the stuff Toronto has, but you've got this. I always, I always say it's, we've got a, we're a little big city, right? We've got a lot of the big city stuff, but we've got that little city Little town mentality, right? Yeah. Like yeah. We, we do have that sort of camaraderie. We all come together, help yeah. each other out. You know, it's uh, it's very rare for me. Like, mm-hmm. I I know for you it's the same exact story. Like in Canada, like it's very rare for us to walk around without seeing people that we just yep. kind of you know interact with on a regular basis. But I wanted to kind of let the audience know a little bit more about the story behind Brian Johnson. <laughs> the story behind me. Oh wow. Uh, well, I grew up in Canada. I lived, uh, I was born in Glen Karen, which is, I don't know. South was, part of Canada. South part of Canada. Yeah. I had, a, I grew up in a bungalow there that had a pink, wow, you got to love 70s. It was, it was like this pink, pink garage door. Nice. <laughs> pink door. And it had pink shutters on it. Oof. It eventually became brown, thank God. But that pink color was still there because my brother and I used to play road hockey all the time and we'd, we'd bang the garage door with the ball and my dad was never happy about that. But yep, so I grew up there. And then in 92, my parents were nice enough. They actually, they stayed in Glencairn to let me finish high school and then they moved to Canada Lakes. Went to Carleton U uh, for my engineering degree. Graduated from there and uh, wound up, I wound up married, have 
my two lovely daughters, which which you have met both of them, 22 and 19 now. Met my wife at university. So we, uh, I now live in, uh, in Morgan's Grant, which is next door. Again, next, yeah, next door, yeah, around the corner. So yeah, so I started at, at Cleveland Jardine right right out of the gate. It's funny, I I always joke or I joke around with few people I know. So the so the the person so they had a they had a person working there in the summers. Mike Cleland, his father in law, worked at the Carlton U, and so this person was working there, and she decided she wanted to move back to Chile. So mm-hmm. well, that's where she is now, and she was like recommended me for the job. Went in, interviewed. I was told never to wear a tie again, even though I wear a tie all the time. I'm not wearing a tie today, but and so yeah, I've been there for 30 years, and then during that time, had two girls. Um, they're awesome. I love my two. They are the best. They are like my world. My oldest daughter now is in occupational therapy at McMaster. Youngest is in uh, science at uh, UVO. I think one of my one of my best accomplishments was pretty much how we met, doing being a soccer coach yeah, for yeah, fifteen and years. Uh, and I think what happened is, I think one year I coached your daughter. The next year you coached mine. Yep. and then the year after we co co coached. Uh, I was we, kind of helping in and out. You helped me in and out. I, yeah. I, I, I was funny. I was trying to think of our stories from you about you and I. And I remember the remember the one game we had to referee because the referees yeah. didn't show up. And of course, you know me. I don't know soccer. Well, I know soccer enough. I've learned enough about soccer to coach it. But you also saw the way I coached. I'm mm-hmm. more of the motivator. And uh, yeah. And I use a little bit of hockey. But I always try to get somebody who knew what they were doing. But I remember us. You know, I went out and started refereeing. And I, I think you came out and you're like... <laughs> I need to help you, Ryan. Like, Thank that's you. not going to work. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, that's a bad call, but I, sure. <laughs> and I was like, just don't let the parents get mad at me. And I remember telling the parents on the sidelines, and I, the other coach, I said, if I do this, if any of your parents get out of line, just remember, I'm doing the best I can. I yeah. am not a referee, and we, it's either we call this game because the refs are not here, or we just kind of wing it the best we can. Mm-hmm. And I think my wife at the time, she's like, oh, why don't you just help? And I said. Okay, let me just talk to Brian and see what happens. Yeah, I don't want to just take over. Yeah. No, it was interesting times. Like I did, those are probably the the most influential times of their life. It's just, you know, yeah. being there for them to help them out through the the growth and, and what have you. And, and I, I love our community in Canada. Yeah. How everybody's just out there helping, you know, the parents are kind of contributing and, and, and all of that stuff. One of the most interesting stories, I think, this was actually what I was coaching. Mm-hmm. So I had one of the parents complain that I was like, okay, well, what is it that we're complaining about? It's like, oh, the time that you're giving my daughter on the field is not really enough. And I said, oh, okay, no problem. I wanted her to come in the next day. And I said, listen, here's what we're going to do. I'd like you to be my helper. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you the timesheet and you're going to keep track of the time and, and also keep track of the subs. I'll just do the coaching. By the end of the game, she came back and she said, I'm not doing this again. Thank you so much. I don't, this is hard. This is hard Mm -hmm. work. And what they don't realize most of the time is that we're just we're just parents. We're yeah. doing it as volunteers. We're here to help. Yep. So I want to go back to BPA mm-hmm. and understand a little bit about the vision for you guys for the next two to three years. What does mm-hmm. that look like? I know you've just finished the planning and all of that. So maybe that could help us out shedding some light on yeah. what the Ottawa should expect from BPA. Well, fun, I mean, first of all, one of our objectives is, is I mean, I think we're focused on making sure, like I said, we get the three pillars into every one of our major. I think we're very much committed to focus on sustainability and um, environmental responsibility. There are a lot of people there who realize that the world is changing Mm -hmm. and we need to change. Well, actually, we've always had a very dedicated group to making sure that we are sustainable, looking at new emerging emerging technology. That We want to, I guess, partially double down on that and really get into like, there's so many more things that are critical to the way the world is evolving. You know, we want to be leaders in those kind of sectors to say, when you pick up the phone or you decide that you need to, you need to get somebody to, to work on a, either a brand new building or retrofitting existing buildings. That's a, that's a huge thing right now. If we yeah. look at, we look at the conversions right now. So we've done, structurally, we've done multiple conversions, but our, also our mechanical electrical groups have done m- multiple conversions as well. It's, and there are ways that you can do these conversions now that you can, you can improve the mechanical electrical systems by such a high level now to make a building that, you know, that was built in the 70s, that was just, you know, drawing energy like you wouldn't believe mm-hmm. to be, could be being a leader 
building in terms of how how energy efficient it is. So we're definitely committed to that. And so we, we believe firmly in that environmental responsibility and also a social responsibility to being part of understanding that we are part of communities, right? And we're not just you know, engineers, engineering, we live in our communities, we are part of them. And yeah. we want to, we want to, we want to be those people that when we are sitting at the table, we're, we're letting owners know about the opportunities they have to not just build the building one way, but what are the couple of other ways you could build it that may have other benefits to it. I think that's a big thing. We're looking at emerging technologies too. Obviously AI is a big one. It's a scary one and it's a not scary one. How do we, it was, when we were talking about, you know, I've, I've been to a couple seminars on it. We had somebody come into our, our, our group and talk about AI and how do you bring in AI while still keeping the humanity of it? Because yep. ultimately, ultimately AI is coming. You can't stop it. I mean, that much everybody can acknowledge. It's just how do you bring it in in a way that you still help young people grow and evolve? Uh, because ultimately, in 10 years from now, if everybody's used AI for 10 years, Who's going to be the people that replace me in terms of like my brain has, I started with a pen and paper, right? I'm old school at times. And there, there's times that I'll sit down and I'll sketch stuff in front of young engineers. I'm like, well, we'll go to the computer. I'm like, forget the computer. Let's just. You guys do it later. Let's, we'll do that later. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's just, let's drop some ideas right here on a piece of paper. And so, you know, I'm able to do the litmus test, right? Like you are, you know, and what you do, right? There's, there's what the hard numbers say, but then there's, you know, kind of what this is said just mm -hmm. from the experience you guys say. Yeah, that doesn't quite, you know, your numbers say this, but that doesn't quite, it's not it's sitting mark, right. Yeah. Let's, let's try to, let's look at it from a different avenue. So my only concern about AI is really what happens to the, the personal and professional growth of younger people when they're, if we push it too hard, too fast, what happens to their critical thinking? And to me, critical thinking is so important in any business or, uh, engineering, what you do, the critical thinking of the strategic planning. And if yeah. an AI generates your strategic plan for you or your AI generates your ideas for you, how do you become a generator of ideas yourself? So that's the part I would say, like, we want to bring it in with humanity. To mm -hmm. it. It's one of the biggest things for us, like in, in our industry as well, to the having AI, obviously, like, a, you know, it saves me so much time, for example, like writing scripts or talking about putting videos together and things like that, ideas, doing a listing presentation, all of that stuff can be done through AI, but it won't replace that human element that we have, which is that sitting there with the owners of the buildings and really just get that gist of how they're feeling about the project yep. or how they're feeling about selling or buying or, you know, what sort of real estate mark they want to leave on the map. Mm -hmm. kind of thing. What I wanted to chat with you about, you've kind of touched a little bit on it, the retrofitting. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's in Ottawa now. It's a massive, specifically around the core, the downtown core. There's a lot of office buildings that are right now, we're having almost like 30% vacancies when it comes to offices. Mm -hmm. Massive. And this is all a product of the pandemic, right? Like it's, all this stuff yeah. has just kind of started piling up. Like a, for example, I'll give you a very simple example. If I were to find an office in Canada right now, there's a vacancy of less than 4%. Mm -hmm. it's almost impossible. But that same sort of engineer can go out and open up a place in downtown Ottawa right now and get probably, I want to say almost one third of the rent. Yep. Just because of the fact that there are a lot of the, the offices downtown and it's no longer there. Right. So there's a lot of retrofitting happening. We're looking at buildings that are, you know, essentially used to be that kind of space and now moving into possibly condos and things like that. Yep. What is BPA sort of vision in those kind of and how can you guys help the city? I mean, ultimately, our how we can be part of it is to well, there's there's a couple of ways. One is you know I, t I talk a, lot, a little bit about you know being an industry leader, being a, f a forward thinker as it relates to what are the ways that you can take some of these old school buildings and replace them, replace their infrastructure mm -hmm. with something that's more energy efficient. You know, because if you're going to, converting a building is not cheap. It's no. not free. It it's maybe less expensive than than building brand or tearing it down and building brand new right on top of it. Yeah. But at the same time, there's so like if you look at it's just a standard office building, right? Like the the mechanical infrastructure is built around, you know, large scale distribution of services. It's not built to deliver it to one, you know, all these individual units. So how do you replace or modify all that mechanical and electrical equipment with energy efficient yeah. equipment? Um, you know, 
from a structural perspective, it's, and I've talked to a, you know, a number of different developers, is like, get us involved early when you start looking at your conceptual plans on how to convert some of these spaces. Like, how do we do it in a way so we mitigate the structural impact? Like, you can go in there and you can take the, the existing stairwells and elevator cores and you can, you know, blow a million holes in them, but then you're going to wind up spending millions of dollars trying to upgrade the building to, to meet the code. Uh, so there are ways that you can be very strategic about it. So I think the the where we can make some of the biggest differences is being part of the thinking of those things and and having people trust that we know what we're doing yeah. and that we can guide things in a certain way that will be that will be of a benefit to the owners and we're and we're not we're also a little bit outside the box too. Like sometimes you when you're converting or retrofitting or modifying an existing building, you've got to think a little bit more beyond just what the, the ones and zeros tell you, right? Mm -hmm. There's got to be a little bit of that creativity to what you do. And that's, that I think is really, really important to what we're doing. Uh, you have to be able to be willing to think about some different ways that still are obviously meet the code, but are not necessarily the conventional approaches to yeah. what we're doing. So, um, Fantastic. And I just on a last note, I wanted to, you know, with the history, you've been there for 20 some years, 28 years, yeah. 28 years. What are some of the words of wisdom that you'd want to pass on to some young engineers coming into the industry? I always, I mean, it kind of goes back to what I was talking about the you know, finding the passion in each side of things. Yeah. I really think that young engineers need to, need to develop that passion for what they're doing at a young age. Um, that's, that's, to me, that's one thing, cause that's going to drive you in the cold nights, right? Because what we do is not, you know, we're not punching a clock no. You know, we don't wake up in the morning and they say, you need to make a hundred widgets. And we know we can make a hundred widgets for anybody who doesn't know what a widget is, but you know, the theoretical, whatever it is, thing that could be made. We never know whether we're going to make a hundred widgets in a day or a thousand. It depends because schedules change, building people, you know, buildings change, uh, designs change. So it's never just a simple nine to five. You know, there's going to be some days that are a little longer, some days that are a little quieter because again, we can never, we don't know exactly yeah. how many widgets are going to be ordered that day. So finding a passion because that's going to drive you through what you do and, and looking at every, every project as an opportunity to grow, develop, learn more. I think that's one of the most critical aspects of becoming, you know, an engineer and being willing to, to, to enter the field. Uh, the other thing is, and it, I know it's so hard because so many of the younger people now are so driven. They're so, they're so driven to, to grow and develop, but sometimes they forget that sometimes you just got to walk. Like you don't yeah. have to run every second of every day. The patience, patience. Be patient, like let experience happen. And, and I got it. You worked on a 30 story building in the first two years of your career. It doesn't mean you can do every building. It just means you've done one. You've applied fundamental principles. Give yourself your time. And hopefully, and that's one of the things I try to do is, is whether I'm a mentor or a leader to some people, put your faith and trust in your mentors. And that hopefully you have the right ones that are going to that get you to understand is that my objective is to make you successful. Mm -hmm. Because if I make you successful, I'm going to succeed. And... That's ultimately one. I always say I'm looking for somebody who's going to replace me one day. I'm never looking for someone to just come and pass in through yep. the doors. It's funny as I, I think about this, it goes back to so much what I learned about being that soccer coach for so many years. Those girls, you know, when we first met the parents, the girls that were on that field, I had to let them, they had to develop a trust in me and I had to develop and I had to earn it. Right. Yeah. And I apply that all the time. Like, that's what you got to do to help lead people is get them to come buy into your vision. Parents had to buy into what I was doing. The girls had to buy into what I was doing, mm -hmm. what we were doing. And ultimately they did. And that's how they became so good is that they all bought in. They, they all pulled for everybody. Yeah. So I think when I first started to the same, same kind of situation with the coaching was my goal is to make sure that your kid loves to play. Mm -hmm. I don't care if they can't kick the ball, but yep. they love to play and they come back the next year. Yep. And then that's really is the whole idea is to just kind of be driven through passion versus goals and aspiration, all of that stuff. Yeah. That all stuff, don't get me wrong, it's great. But without that sort of passion to it, I don't mm -hmm. think it's going gonna, it's gonna to end up being there. 
Brian, this is amazing. Thank you so much for being on a part of our show. We really uh, appreciate you coming in and giving us kind of what BPA is all about and giving us a little bit of an insight about the whole industry and all of that. Icon, if you guys haven't seen it, it's an icon in Canada. And then now with the uh, with the new you know sort of amalgamation with the new company, we'll get a new sign up in the next in the next uh, two or three months. The we'll sign, sign will up. be up. Yeah, yeah. that's the fantastic. One, Check it out. It's on yeah. Palladium. Yeah. Again, Brian, thank you so much for being part of the show, being on here Appreciate on uh, Canada on the Rocks. And guys, if you like what you see, please don't forget to hit the like button. And for more episodes like this, and you want to see more businesses around the city that are contributing and bringing massive, massive change to the city, just let us know. Uh, put it in the uh, comment and don't forget to subscribe so you can get more of these sort of things coming up. And we know exactly what you, know, what you like and, and what have you, and we can keep go doing what we're doing. Thanks again. Really appreciate it and have a great day.